France and Germany, neighboring countries and driving forces within the European Union, are quite different in their ways of doing things. Just look at how they refer to their mutual friendship. In France, we speak of the French-German couple, while in Germany we use the phrase French-German engine. And for those who watch TV, you may know the show in which farmers are looking for their future wives, which in France is called L'amour est dans le pré, love is in the meadow, while the German title for the exact same show is Bauer sucht Frau, farmer searches woman. Less romantic in German, perhaps, but certainly more functional to the point. Following the same logic, in France you wear your wedding ring on the left hand, closer to the heart. In Germany it is worn on the right hand, the one you shake hands with so that people can immediately feel if you're married. Obviously this would be less useful in France, which privileges the famous la bise for greeting purposes. In France we would have a single blanket in a couple's bed, while in Germany there will be two blankets, more practical. Then there is the food considered an art in France, but less so in Germany. Wine for the French is a sophisticated matter, while the Germans like their wine schorle, that is, wine mixed with sparkling water, unimaginable in France. In Paris there are 10 three-star Michelin restaurants, in Berlin there is one. In France on Christmas Eve you would probably eat foie gras or oysters, but in Germany you'll get sausage and potato salad, more convenient when there are overexcited children awaiting their gifts. There is a reason why in Germany we have the saying of living like God in France. And speaking of cooking, maybe you also know another TV show in which people cook for one another in their homes, grading the respective culinary result. In France it's called le dîner presque parfait, the almost perfect dinner, while in Germany the same show is called das perfekte dinner, the perfect dinner. This slight but significant difference is certainly also due to the grading system in schools. While in France a perfect score of 20 out of 20 is hardly ever reached, the best grade in Germany is totally achievable. So many other examples exist. Red lights in France are considered as an indication, in Germany as a regulation. Time in France is a more flexible concept, while in Germany it is an exact science. In general, flexibility and adaptability are strengths of France, whereas more German qualities are efficiency and rigor. All these examples are symbols of equally different approaches to management and leadership. France more driven by emotions, and Germany rather functional in nature. An EU MP once told me that obviously whenever France and Germany would agree on something, then the hardest part was done. And he was not referring to their size and power within Europe, but rather even more so to their cultural differences. If France and Germany agreed on an issue, all the other countries were a piece of cake. So the French-German relationship within Europe is of high significance to strengthen European integration despite or rather because of their differences and their diverse approaches. This is the point I wanted to make and as a rector and dean of ESCP in Berlin and Paris I have quite an intensive experience myself on those matters. This is the reason why we launched this new event series titled The French-German Leadership Discourse, with the aim to have a conversation with a thought leader from the French-German business world. Today we have the great honor to listen to René Obermann, former CEO of Deutsche Telekom, who has extensive experience in French-German leadership differences, certainly most recently in his new role as chairman of the board of directors of Airbus. Thank you for sharing your experience with us and without further ado, I wish you all an inspiring French-German leadership discourse. From my side, dear guests, a very warm welcome. Uh, to our first French-German discourse here at the ESCP campus in Berlin. Indeed, the French-German uh, relations are and have been of the utmost importance for Europe and they, they are particularly are in these uh, very times. And what better place could we find to have this discourse on the French-German issues than the ESCP campus here in Berlin? And I'm thrilled to have a really distinguished guest, one of the foremost European leaders in business, René Obermann, who is dedicating one hour for our questions and my questions. Um, a very warm welcome to you, René. Thank you, Klaus. So why not? 
kicking off directly uh, with some questions. Um, um, basically, everybody knows you, former CEO of Deutsche Telekom, now uh, co-head uh, Europe of uh, Warburg Pinkers, uh, chairman uh, of Airbus. Um, but probably for, for, for the larger audience, uh, many will remember your time with Deutsche Telekom. And one could think, especially perhaps the students out there, that um, your career is one of these careers really masterly crafted, designed from scratch. Mm -hmm. But uh, if one goes into your biography, one sees that you uh, started a business as a startup entrepreneur when even the, the, the notion didn't exist. And then somehow you stumbled into telecom. So uh, why not explaining a little bit about your, your background and your, your startup entrepreneur experience? Sure, happy to do that. Um, indeed, it wasn't planned. It was not strategic whatsoever. It was uh, initially more coincidental because I needed to do something. I needed to work something in order to finance my studies. Um, and so I, I was in Münster studying economics. and. Um, I started to kind of trade with some goods in order to make some money. And uh, at some stage, I, um, I met a guy who, who was kind of a wholesaler for telecommunication equipment at the time that was not really privatized. That was more or less in the domain of the former monopoly companies, Deutsche Telekom at the time it, uh, it was Bundespost and, so, and, and others. And uh, so I, I figured out that there was quite an interest, uh, a high level of interest and a pent up demand in uh, more innovative products and communication uh, tools. And so I started to sell these devices initially one by one, and I figured out that they were you know, selling very well. And that was the basis for building a company, which uh, I started out of my <clears throat> student apartment, uh, which turned into one of the first mobile virtual network operators in Germany in the early 90s. And, um, Initially, you know, from my student apartment to the first steps, the, the first steps also, that was all bootstrapped. Venture capital at the time was a uh, less common um, phenomenon and um, not available uh, for me at the time anyway, and I wouldn't even know how to approach this. So I just bootstrapped it, took it from scratch, and uh, eventually turned into a triple digit uh, revenue company. And, and how did you end up with Deutsche Telekom then? Because it's not the natural way to be a startup entrepreneur yeah. and then becoming CEO of Deutsche Telekom, yeah. large conglomerate. I, I guess I was too much of a nuisance to them because uh, um, I was also heading a, an association of the private mobile uh, virtual network operators. And we were always fighting for our rights and fighting for not being discriminated and squeezed out by the networks. There were only two network infrastructures and we were MVNOs, which is by nature a business model with tight margins. And so the networks were in control, the network operators, Deutsche Telekom and Vodafone at the time. And we uh, built an association and fought for our rights with antitrust authorities and so on, not to get squeezed out by those networks because we were sitting between them and the end users and they didn't like that model as, that much. So I, I, I fought for our rights and for some reason, uh, Ron Sommer and uh, Kai Uwe Ricke, um, who I knew from, from that these days, uh, they kind of felt it was a good idea to get me on board. And after 12 years in my, whole, in my own little company, which I had um, eventually sold to uh, Hutchison and Poa, um, you know, I felt it was time to do something else and uh, to see a bit more of the world rather than sit in my, my small little entity in Münster. That's how it came. And then uh, after a certain time, you were responsible for the mobile business mm -hmm. with Deutsche Telekom, yep. which was kind of the, the new kid on the block, yep. Uh, yep. kind of in-house yep. uh, competition to the landliners. Yep. Was this kind of a disruption thing we see right yeah. now also uh, in other areas of business? Yeah, I mean, it was, a, it was for, the, for the business books, basically, because um, Deutsche Telekom and other incumbent telecom operators were mostly monopoly, ex-monopoly state-owned landline companies who provided mobile telephony services as it was and then later on uh, uh, um, some, some, some text, uh, um, uh, text services to, uh, to households and to companies, but pretty old stuff. And 
Ron Sommer at the time, this is in the 90s, uh, he realized that wireless communication, so personal communication, would be a future growth area for Deutsche Telekom. And therefore, he hired a bunch of, um, you know, kind of rebel young guys like myself. I was in my early 40s, 30s um, to run the mobile division and built it up from scratch, more or less. And uh, that recipe worked because he gave us the chance to start on a green field and not to care about corporate suffoc suffocation, like the corporate yeah. you know, reflexes would be to suffocate this internal rebel who basically was cannibalizing the fixed line revenue. And, and bear in mind, the fixed line business had hundreds of thousands of employees and wireless was very small but grew very fast and would eat into their lunch. But Ron at the time, he had the vision and the foresight to establish that wireless division from scratch on the green field, hiring some kind of you know, unusual guys like myself, more entrepreneurial folks, and, and made them run that business and kept, kept us protected against the large corporate uh, typical reflexes. So that, I think it's a very important lesson to be learned from. And it worked. And we eventually, our mission was to become market leader to fight against Vodafone, who had a natural advantage, and we did that within a few years. And, and with this growing business, uh, and probably your, your, your personal performance, you made it up to the helm of, of Telecom as a CEO. Yeah. And I think these, w w when you stepped in, did, this was quite a challenging time for, for Telecom. Why? Oh, um, because um, the ex-monopoly business, was, which was very personal intense, with, as I said, like 200,000 people or so, that got privatized. And not only privatized, it got asymmetrically regulated. So the competition was favored by better terms. They could use the infrastructure of Deutsche Telekom at very low rates, and that induced pricing pressure. So Telekom's revenues and customers were shrinking and uh, the, the cost flexibility of that large corporation, which was also, you know, in the, um, which was kind of t tightly, strongly influenced by unions and so on, the cost structure of that large corporation was very inflexible. So it was a double whammy. And on top to create the perfect storm came IP, internet technology. So all of a sudden you had your networks, which were your bread and butter business, where revenue came in, you know, in mass massively from, that was regulated, prices were regulated, your competition was upcoming, and all of a sudden you had a new technology which kind of took away the former proprietary technology, high, high revenues, high prices. So it was a perfect storm. And um, so we're talking about the year 2003, 4, 5, 6, and um, yeah, that, that, was the, uh, that was the reason. And wireless was always growing, so the division I was responsible for did quite well. That wasn't my, you know, not because of me, but because it was a growing industry. And uh, so for, for that reason, I guess I, I, you know, I got put in charge mm. for the um, whole corporation. Talking about German, French, French, German relations, uh, if I remembered right, that at that point uh, you very much pushed uh, for um, at least um, a French-German alliance oh, in yeah. telecommunications, oh, yes. if yeah. not a European one. So what, what was the rationale behind this? Well, in the first place, Deutsche Telekom <coughs> was strong in Germany or eventually got stronger again and became very competitive again, not only in wireless but also in the wireline business, in the traditional business. But you could see that the industry as such was more and more driven by technology innovation based on internet technology and by strong uh, technology vendors who would you know, sell you components for your networks and, and uh, for you, so you could provide network services. And so that was a globalization, like you know, the likes of Huawei or Ericsson or so, they, they all became global and, uh, and strong. So eventually, it's industrial logic that you have to also you know, get your scale up. And so we, you know, my, my French counterparts and, and, and myself and, and our teams um, got along very well. And we, had, we shared some of the vision um, of the industry development. 
And we figured that within procurement, that's the most natural thing to, to work together. And we created something um, uh, to, called buy-in. That was a, a joint venture for procuring uh, goods and, and services. And, and that was eventually, you know, became a $20 billion activity. So it was fairly sizable. Also then we put together some of the subscale operations we had for in, in the UK and we created the market leader in the UK together. Um, and we, we worked on interoperability of services across borders. So a couple of very tangible products and very tangible projects um, which made sense. And, um, but we could do that because we had a cultural proximity and the teams worked together very, worked together very well, up until today, by the way. But on the large scale, this didn't really materialize to say we, we build a European large incumbent which would be a competitor to Vodafone. Um, I, I understand that still in the moment we have so many players in Europe if you compare it to the players you would see in the US. So what, 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 the hin what is the hindrance to build up such a European champion? Look, it's something I, I really can't talk about because it's, uh, it's obviously it's of, of uh, strategic nature and, and I, I also shouldn't speak about that. Yeah. That's something you should talk to Tim about, my yeah. successor. But um, <clears throat> what we did and what Telecom and France Telecom Orange are still doing makes a lot of sense. They're, they're continuing you know, close cooperation yeah. and, uh, on many, on, in many areas. And therefore, you know, I'm, I'm very happy and a little bit proud as well mm. that we got this started. Mm. And, um, uh, and, and I personally think you know, that Germany and France uh, on the business sector <clears throat> where scale matters mm. in many other areas as well, including cloud and including, you know, internet technologies um, and, and um, IT security and so on. There are many areas where there's close cooperation, um, very sensible. And uh, so I hope to see more of that. Mm -hmm. Let me just quickly turn to our uh, distinguished audience. Uh, we have the possibility that you hand in uh, written questions to the floor via the chat function. So feel free already now to type it in and we will dedicate the, the last 20 minutes or so for, for you questions. Um, going back again to your telecom time, kind of out of all of a sudden you decided to leave telecom um, when you uh, were... All of a sudden after 16 years. 16 okay? years. So that's, I'm not um, exactly a job but, but many uh, uh, commentaries in the media said, why now? Because he, he basically... Um, did all the foundations for future success yeah. and he could earn, but now he, he's going to, a, uh, first you went to a, a much more smaller yeah. player in, uh, in the Netherlands and then you became partner of Warburg Pingus Private yeah. Equity, totally different business. Mm. The emotional leader, René Oberman, goes to the coldest possible business, private equity. So what was the reason behind midlife crisis? Uh, not at all. I, for some reason, I, I kind of missed that part in my life. Perhaps it's still to come, although midlife is over, I guess. Um, 16 years at Telecom. Uh, and after these um, seven and a half years or seven, and, seven years and a few months of, of leading the corporation, um, it was, the company was competitive again. Uh, I think that's no doubt. The company had developed a strong brand, a strong service position. It was very competitive, again, in Germany and in other markets. We had fixed most of our portfolio issues. And the U.S. was on a, on a much better path again. We had new management in place. We had, out of a very difficult situation, uh, you know, two years before, we, we had created some, you know, basis for future growth, merged with uh, another big operator in the U.S., you know, got a deal with Apple, hired John Ledger, who was kind of an absolute superb leader for that company and so on. So I felt like it's a good time to hand over to somebody I, I truly appreciate as a you know, perfect and wonderful successor and who actually is, in many respects, has a different style than I have and I think is the absolute right person for the next period. And I felt like you know, I worked with Tim for 14 years. He was a perfect successor. So the business was in better shape. It's never perfect, but it was in much better shape. I felt like after 16 years, I needed to go back to a smaller thing and become more entrepreneurial again, um, which is where I come from. Um, and I felt I had, you know, there was a perfect successor in sight. So I approached the board and suggested that you know, we should get into that discussion. And then I stayed on for more than a year before Tim took over. Okay, and then first you went to Zigo, which was 
bought by Liberty, I think, That's after correct. a short, yeah, after short period. Yeah. And, and, and then you went to, to Warburg Pinkus mm -hmm. Private Equity. Um, so far, probably not a business you were very much familiar with. That's exactly right. And, and that's why I was really, really keen and curious to learn. It was the one, I wouldn't say blind spot, that would be an exaggeration, <clears throat> because I can definitely read numbers, and I could read numbers before, um, but I was not a, let's say, a quantitative, super analytical, um, good investor before, I guess, because that's something which, you know, which, where I was lacking some educational background and I was curious how this would work and what differentiates a good investor from a bad investor. And I think, to be very honest, in corporations, there's a lot of value destruction because of bad M&A, mm. right? And so, um, and we all made our mistakes in, in over the years. And so I, I was so curious to learn more about that trade. And it also you know, became, an, uh, the opportunity came, which before probably wouldn't have come, and I just grabbed it. I felt like this is something I really want to do and I want to become, let's say, good at, or reasonably good at, at least. Um, and Warburg Pincus gave me the chance as a, you know, coming from the side. And, um, and so I'm working with fantastic people there, uh, super talented and smart people from whom I learn a lot up until today, but I've learned some of the trade. And I think the combination between, for instance, Adash, my, my, my European co-head, or Max Vowinkel, my, my German partner, um, and the team is just great because we bring complementary skills and experiences, and I honestly learn a lot. And to be very honest, I think some of that learning uh, I can apply in future years as well as a corporate chairman. So, I, I mean, many former CEOs, they, uh, after their uh, uh, career, um, join kind of private equity houses. But there is a difference because you, you, you did not become a senior advisor oh, or senior no, expert, no, but yeah. you, you became a managing director, which is yeah, totally part, different. Yeah, so, yeah. so, how is it being the CEO of a conglomerate yeah. with 200,000 employees being the, the apprentice <laughs> uh, in, 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 in a private equity house? I, I, most of it I loved, uh, not all, because it's, you have, it, would be, it, would be dis, it would be not honest if I said it was always easy. Because you're used to calling the shots, right? You're used to making decisions, you're used to being informed, being properly briefed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And all of a sudden, you have to do much of your, you know, briefing and preparation. Mm. You have to do your own analysis, find out data and information mm. yourself, and so on. You have a smaller, much smaller team, and so on. So it, it was a quite a transition or transformation. Mm. On the other side, I was looking for that because when you are a corporate leader over many years, there is a danger that you professionally degenerate. Mm -hmm. And it, it has an effect on your, on your personality. And it, it makes you kind of unfit for the real world again. And I, was, I think I was coming close to that point. So I felt like I jump now mm. or it's too late. So with, within uh, Warburg Pincus, I, I got support. Um, but I also had to learn some of the things the hard way. And uh, again, I had, I had fantastic colleagues who were very tolerant with me. Yeah. I mean, for instance, Max Vowinkel, my, my, my German partner, uh, I, I can't believe why he's still loyal. <laughs> 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 because I think he does so much, he knows so much more about the business than I do. But, but again, we were complementary. And um, so it, it's, it's a great learning experience. And I can recommend for people to kind of change roles in yeah. their life and redefine themselves. Because life is too long, mm -hmm. if you're lucky too long for just doing one thing. Mm. You have to kind of reinvent yourself every once in a while. Perhaps some news to use for our students. You said you, you, you got along with numbers, but you, you weren't really a number cruncher up to this very moment. So how <clears> important <throat> would you think that, that every student going into the, the, the business world has a certain level of... Strongly uh, recommend that. I strongly recommend that. I strongly recommend that every student you know, take some time for strategic finance and for the basics. I mean, my background, my educational background, is very unusual um, because I did a professional education program at BMW. I didn't really have more than a few semesters, a few half years at university. 
but the education at BMW was very, the basic education mm. was very good, but it was not comparable to a, you know, a mm. good four or five years of, of, of university or mm. three years of bachelor plus a master program because it was less theoretical, less intense. So yeah. I would strongly recommend that people really do some, get some basics for the finance education because it plays a role in, in everything they do yeah. thereafter. Even in marketing, yeah, everywhere. It's not just about being creative, but also being, you know, understanding yeah. commercially and financially what yeah. you do. Talking about, let's say, your core business, the Warburg uh, Pinkus thing. You, you recently gave an interview in Bloomberg, uh, mid-January, and you said there will be many deals this year, quite probably. So what, what, what makes you so positive about this, this rather bleak uh, year in, under corona conditions? Look, I mean, there's in, an enormous amount of money in circulation seeking investments, investment opportunities. And, um, you know, m money has become so cheap to tap into um, that, that it's almost a natural consequence there is a lot of a uh, lot of demand for, for good investments and good companies these days, they, they can select, pick and choose their investors. So there is a high, high degree of, of activity in 2020. We at WP, at Warburg Pincus, uh, were very active. Uh, in Europe alone, since June last year, we did, uh, or our funds, Warburg Pincus funds invested more than, uh, invested seven, in, in seven companies in Europe alone. And, you know, we do larger deals. We mm. don't do small venture capital. We, we do larger deals, usually of triple digit sizes. So we invested a fair amount of money and globally even more so. And you personally, do you have a certain area of expertise yeah. um, um, where you look at? So yeah, I mean, things are converging, though, um, because there's hardly any business without any tech component in there. Um, you know, where, where my, you know, education and background, my home is, of course, in communications technology and in communication services. Uh, and over the last years, I've developed some insights into um, internet services as well, as we are, for instance, a, um, an investor and uh, also actively supporting the management team of IONOS. IONOS is one of the uh, leading European uh, cloud companies, enterprise cloud companies, but also the leading European web hosting yeah. company. So my expertise has been broadened a bit, uh, thank, thanks to the ability and the opportunity at Warburg Pinkus to invest in, in, and do different business cases. But it's still the communication and technology yeah. and software space. Talking about software and internet, yeah. uh, several times you emphasized that Europe is terribly lacking uh, behind yeah. uh, on a global scheme. Yeah. Um, so what, what, what's the reason behind, in your view, to, to, to start with? Well, if you look at the structural reason to begin with, Europe is a super fragmented marketplace. Uh, whilst you know, young companies in the United States, they can scale pretty quickly. Uh, within Europe, you have 27, unfortunately, now. Used, used to be 28 different um, still different uh, states and uh, member states and uh, differences in the, in the uh, uh, regulatory and, and uh, legal systems, plus the language issue. And you cannot simply set up a company and, and quickly roll it out across uh, the whole of Europe. You have to re-register, set up subsidiaries. Within Europe, there are quite complex role, uh, rules if you, for instance, want to even if you change a brand and you had been established in one country and you want to change a brand and internationalize something, it has tax consequences yeah. and so on. So it is not all that easy to work in a European environment and scale up quickly yeah. um, as, as it should be, number one. Number two, uh, the, for a long time, the availability of venture capital and uh, investments in Europe were well below the amounts of uh, capital in the United States. And more recently also you see a boom in Asia. But Europe is catching up now. You saw more and more capital flowing into Europe uh, more recently. So that's, I'm optimistic it's improving. And then, you know, we had a, um, we have lost the race in about, for the consumer data uh, race that has been, because we were all so blinded by the very free of charge services that we didn't understand that we were paying not only with our data, but as somebody from Harvard recently said it, we were kind of you know, paying with our 
future behavior, which mm. is now uh, aggregated and sold uh, uh, to um, advertising companies. And, 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 and that kind of that model we basically lost. We may lose the, the race for industrial data as well, because you know, whilst we are good at the core industrial services, we are not yet as good as collecting the data and making use of them. So we have the likes of Palantir are based in the US, and they are, they are the dominant player in, in Europe, or Azure, or, in, or these platforms, or Google, um, for analyzing, for, for data analytics, predictive maintenance, yeah. uh, whatever, you know, the application, you name it. Um, and so we need to catch up there. But I'm not overly pessimistic because the good news is we have more than more developers now and more tech developers than in the United States, and we also seem to be becoming more dynamic in terms of setting up young companies and the entrepreneurship. So capabilities, venture capital, more entrepreneurial dynamic. These are three good yeah. ingredients for at least not losing over the next years, but catching up at some yeah. stage. So normally, business guys are not those asking for more regulation. But, but I remember, uh, I think it's five years ago, uh, in, 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 in a business format, you said uh, perhaps it was a mistake that we so uh, willingly opened up uh, the European market for players like Google or for, for uh, other platforms. So would you still think that, that we should have a closer look where we have to protect European markets? No, I'm not, I'm not a protectionist. Yeah. I, I strongly believe in open markets um, and in, in level playing field competition. The asymmetry you are referring to had a different background. I was, I was referring to at the time the, the fact that <clears throat> internet companies could interconnect with telecommunication infrastructures um, at, at very low cost and they could bring their services to all the users you know, at very super low costs. And telecommunication infrastructures were regulated and the regulators did not understand for a long time that it takes scale in order to build new infrastructures up and that it takes, it, it should not be an asymmetric regulation to the benefit of all the internet companies and to the disbenefit of the telecommunication infrastructures. I think now they understand but they would not be open-minded if I, you know, I, the, the red carpet was rolled out for, you know, all these so admired uh, great companies for, to, uh, where we are now more critical yeah. about the misuse of data and so on. But when I said those things 10 years ago, that people pay with their data, pay with their, you know, their future, um, the value of their yeah. data in the future, and their personal profiles mm. and so on, nobody would listen. They all were so excited that mm. they could get everything for free. Mm. That was the thing I was referring mm. to. The regulation was asymmetric to the disadvantage of telecommunication mm. infrastructures and to the advantage of, of, of internet companies who could provide communication services for free, mm. as we thought, by just collecting our data mm. and profiles. Talking about digital competitiveness. Uh, the, the colleagues here of uh, ACP had this digital riser report and yeah. I, I know you know it. And there was the interesting finding um, last year that France made it up the ranks, yes. uh, skyrocketed yes. and, and, and Germany uh, fell behind. So is, is this also your observation that, that France is in a kind of more decisive, uh, more brave in this this uh, very field of, of digital transformation? I think uh, France has undertaken a number of steps in order to stimulate the uh, young company digital ecosystem uh, in a more determined way than Germany did. Um, and, uh, and I think Germany could, could you know, learn a bit from there. Okay. And is this um, kind of something to, to, to come to your kind of most European function in the very moment, being chairman of, of Airbus. Do you feel these different cultures in your daily, in your daily work? Because you have this perfect um, kind of combination of French and, 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 and German talent. Well, first of all, let me say this. Um, Airbus, I think, is a perfect example for, uh, for a global company based in Europe with French and German roots. And, um, and I'm extremely 
proud and privileged to be with that company. And uh, you know the way which, uh, in which the company and particularly Guillaume and his management team, Guillaume Fourier and his management team have mitigated initially the crisis effects and then set up a plan and pursued that plan in order to fight the crisis was exemplary. Exemplary, and uh, you know, the, as you saw recently, we delivered 566 planes last year, and uh, I believe that we can continue to, to manage this crisis well, and that will emerge as an even stronger global leader from this crisis than we went into this crisis. So, it's a great company, and the fact that it's um, <clears throat> it has its roots in Germany and in France, um, I you know, the, the cultures have converged to, to a large extent, I'd say, and it's a global company by now, it, you know, with operations and, and production facilities in China, with production facilities in the United States, in the UK, you know, more than, I think, 14, 15,000 people in the UK and so on. So it's a really global company in, in, many, in many countries and selling across the world. So that is the philosophy. It's not, it's not about, you know, being German or being French. It's about being a global company, but do not forget the role the company pay, plays uh, for Europe. That, that's also important. Before talking about the, the, the crisis management, again, uh, audience be reminded to hand in uh, nasty or bright or whatever questions. Or potentially nice or questions. Or nice uh, <laughs> questions. Yeah. We have some minutes to go and then we will open up uh, the floor. You mentioned uh, crisis mitigation for Airbus. I mean, um, probably th th there has been no market which was struck harder That's by right. corona yeah, right. than um, airlines. So, so yeah. perhaps you could a little bit describe um, or circumscribe how to react uh, if, if, if you just lose, I don't know, 80% uh, of your turnover overnight. Um, well, you know, we sold 566 planes last year, so that is not an 80% reduction. But apart from that, it was initially not clear where it would go. Um, you know, in, in February, March, when this whole thing, you know, broke out and became, you know, it became clear that it's a, it's a global crisis and it's there to stay for some time. Um, first and foremost, confront yourself with the brutal facts and see the world as it is and not as you like it to, to have. So build scenarios which, which reflect the situation realistically and even as brutal as they can be because that gives you the ability to, to, to set up a mitigation plan, to share the reality with the key constituencies, with your key stakeholders within the company and outside and then address the problems one by one. But very important at the beginning that, we, that the company secured itself enough liquidity mm. Uh, to not become, you know, exposed uh, uh, because of, uh, of a few quarters uh, of, of, of the crisis. So liquidity, then, you know, address the capacity issues, reduce overcapacities, ensure that you think in terms of ecosystems and not just in, in, in your own company, uh, uh, you know, expand your, your view because the ecosystem needs to be kept alive. The critical suppliers need to be supported or watched at least, you know, where things are going well and where things are potentially going wrong. Um, engage with the, the states uh, who were, you know, very open and helpful, uh, for instance, with the furlough schemes. Um, and make sure that your employees understand that you do everything possible to, uh, you know, safeguard as many jobs as you can. Um, unfortunately, you know, we, we, we had to reduce capacity and, uh, you know, it does cost jobs, but um, but the, uh, the, effect, the, the efforts we undertake uh, to you know, mitigate these effects are very, very big, and uh, so we'll see how it goes. But be clear, be agile in your planning, do as often as you need to a reforecasting in order to address the new reality, be much more flexible in order to be able to respond. And again, be open and transparent and honest, and share the things with your uh, constituencies, and that's, I think, what Guillaume and the team have done in a very exemplary uh, way. And I have not heard anybody complaining about not being properly informed, not being openly and honestly informed, which is so crucial. So leadership in this, in this situation matters even more than before. 
If I may, this crisis illustrates beyond Airbus, this crisis illustrates the need for having resilience. And it also made me think nothing is for granted. Before, you know, we always did risk analysis, risk heat maps in boardrooms. We, you know, we, we did all kinds of discussions, but it was always a theoretical thing. All of a sudden, a pandemic like this happened, pandemic like this happened, and all of a sudden, an existential risk mm. is there. And it illustrates the need for creating resilience in good times, for having your business continuity planning, disaster recovery mechanisms, because other things can go wrong. And I think that crisis, if anything, helps us to ensure that we will be more resilient, I think in many companies, in many industries, mm. more resilient in the future. Mm. Uh, to make it even worse for, for Airbus, it was not only that you had this corona pandemic, which was very much in the focus of, of, uh, of the public, but um, on the other hand side, you, you were kind of a, of a victim of the, the transatlantic tensions between Europe and the US and, and, and um, not so much seen by the broader public. There was a lot of discussion whether Europe, Germany, Berlin should rather buy new combat jets within Europe with Airbus or just buy them in the US. And I, I didn't really understand, to be honest, this discussion because in no other area of the world you would, would even dare uh, if you have a proper um, uh, product in, in your region uh, for defense to think of uh, buying it abroad. So what, what, what is it? Perhaps you could ex explain a little bit. What, 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 what was the discussion behind this? There are two different things, right? I mean, the WTO tariff war, uh, which the uh, Trump administration has uh, started, um, hit us in, a, in the crisis, and they even increased the tariffs in the, in the crisis. And, um, you know, we were very uh, keen that Europe would take appropriate response. Europe United would take a, an appropriate response, and that eventually this, this tariff war would get, you know, cooled down and uh, people would get back to the negotiation table and figure out a way to remove these tariffs because tariffs aren't any good for anybody. So that's the one thing that came on top of the crisis and I agree with you that aggravated the situation. Um, when it comes to European uh, defense and procurement of defense uh, strategy, um, obviously, I mean, as Airbus, we are very, uh, uh, we, we think Europe should support its European industry, um, but the, the reasons for these procurement decisions are a bit more complex. And uh, uh, we, we got, we got uh, more recently a new order again for, for, the, uh, for the Eurofighter. But the reasons for having a more, let's say, a, uh, buying some American fighters and Airbus fighters, mm. uh, Eurofighters, are, are a bit more complex. So I would rather not elaborate on that. Um, but of course, you know, as Airbus, you would, you would hope to be able to, uh, to support your European nations as much as you possibly mm. can, and in return would get uh, you know, mm. uh, the loyalty and the solidarity mm. from them as well mm. on the procurement side, of course. As we speak, uh, the, the new president of the US will be sworn in, uh, Joe Biden. Are you optimistic that, that we will come to a better understanding again, or, or is it basically the American position uh, America first? No, I think uh, the new administration will be much more cooperative. Um, and I am very optimistic that, uh, you know, the dialogue will, will, will get back to the, to the, uh, to the dialogue um, on, uh, on all matters, you know, on NATO matters as well as on WTO mm. matters, on tariff uh, trade matters and so on. Um, and that the you know, very strong ties between Europe and the United States, mm. States can be revitalized and trust mm. will get re-established. That mm. is at least my hope. Okay. Getting back to the dialogue is perhaps uh, the word for me to ask for uh, some questions um, handed in. So yes, they're coming. So let me see. Um, you started your career as a founder. If you would start a business today, what industry idea would you focus on? The $1 billion question. Okay. 
Um, look, I mean, there, there are so many opportunities uh, to disrupt uh, established and legacy uh, business models where users uh, are really experiencing bad service and uh, you know, where with the help of technology and better use of data um, and you know, digital interface uh, between yourself and, and your users, you can, you can create much better user experience and customer experiences. Give you one example, we more recently made an investment in a company called McMarkler. Um, they basically change all the, let's say, mediocre practices in real estate brokerage by, by using technology consequently and improved decision making and valuations of properties. Um, and, and they are a very fast growing company and so that, that's just one business model. Um, but, but picking one or two areas out of a zillion areas makes, makes little sense. I just think that with the deployment of, of data-based um, decision-making, data-based uh, uh, data analytics, for instance, you can create all kind of new business and better business models than the established ones. Um, in, in the field you're good at, in the field you, are, uh, you, you have expertise. Just open your eyes, analyze where problems are, which problems can be resolved with technology. And I give you, you know, my, my story in the past was Communications was for, for places at the time. You know, people spoke to their, they, they went to their home phone and they picked up the phone and they had a fixed line number at home. They couldn't be personally reached. So that seemed kind of a bad concept. So communication for people as opposed to for places. The problem was clear. The solution came about with technology. Just analyze where problems are, where users are dissatisfied and whether you can do something better with the aid of mobile technology, with 4G, 5G, very fast internet connectivity, um, and, and I'm sure you find the right things for you. Um, additional question to this. Um, do you think Berlin is a good place mm. um, for a startup entrepreneur? I mean, you know Paris, you know London, yeah, you know yeah, yeah, Silicon yeah. Valley. Yeah. No, I think Berlin is a very good place. It is, after all, even though people complain about <clears throat> housing prices and so on, it is, after all, a very affordable place still, um, if you compare it to London or Paris. And it absorbs less energy. <clears throat> and the ecosystem is growing, so you also attract tech talent to Berlin. From all over the world, people come here. And you know the young companies here, very often, the, the language inside the company is English. And so uh, I would suggest Berlin is a good place to be. It's a vibrant ecosystem. It's large enough. Um, and now we even have a new airport. <laughs> Um, why do you think leadership in Germany compared to the US and other European countries is still less diverse? What needs to be done to change this? The US started um, earlier with uh, you know, uh, diversity um, programs and diversity being on top of the mind of, um, for corporate governance. So it, it, it has a, historically it has a um, a longer period of, of you know, being in the public mind and focus and uh, being driven by you know, stakeholders. Um, but I think Germany and Europe are picking up very fast now. <clears throat> and um, for instance, at Deutsche Telekom, we, cre we, we were the first uh, German corporation back in 2010 mm. to uh, establish a so-called female quota where we would say 30% of our leaders by the year uh, 2015 should be female. And uh, at the time, there was the understanding of, of diversity. It was a little limited, mm. I admit that. But you know, at the time, it was kind of revolutionary. Mm. And we got quite far, even though we didn't reach the target, but we got quite far. Mm. So wherever you, you see consolidated effort, you eventually see results. But you also need to see more in the so-called talent pipeline. And that has to be more systematically mm. built. Mm. Obviously, our the viewers understood that you, you, you have kind of uh, a full program. So one asks, how do you reduce and cope with stress? Um, quite frankly, I, 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 I do um, endurance sports like, uh, you know, running, uh, climbing, cycling. That is my, that's pretty much the best way I can do that. Um, it's, I know it sounds profane, but that's really what I do. I kind of move. <laughs> <laughs> and is it the same? kind of stress you feel as a CEO or now in your a position as a, a as a question. That's a very good question. Um, I was a very young CEO, right? Um, when I had my own company initially, uh, I had a lot of 
mental stress because I, you know, I had debt and I wasn't used to having debt and I had no kind of um, cushion from mm. my parents. So if, if that, this had gone wrong, it was my personal debt. Yeah. I would have been dead. dead. <laughs> um, later, when I joined Deutsche Telekom, my early years as T-Mobile CEO were good and fairly, let's say, they were st stressful, but not mentally stressful because we were growing so fast. Mm. Over eight years, you know, we grew by double digit every year. But then when I took over the corporation, it was a restructuring program and it was managing old, you know, scandals which dated back and so on. And I was with my early 40s, I was, I was very much under mental stress because the media, you, you, everything you were doing, you were under, mm. you know, under the radar screen um, in the spotlight. And that kind of stressed me out for, for a couple of years before I learned to deal with that a little better. Um, so the stress came from not so much from the physical exhaustion and the long days and travel and so on, where it's like six or seven days a week, work but it came more from the mental pressure and the being in the public and you know trying to do everything right and not being you know uh, so much criticized in public mm. today it's quantitatively quite stressful because in private equity you basically work a lot um, because it's it's international and you know when there are deal phases you need to be really you know on top of things and there's no break um, and then on top uh, you having this mandate at airbus I find a big responsibility, uh, so it's just quantitatively a lot. But I mentally, I can cope much better than mm -hmm. I could ten years ago. Okay. Perhaps also in this respect, uh, one question, obviously of a student: What advice would you give to a student just, just starting off her career after the after finishing studies? Uh, obviously, yes. I think that's very dependent on the type you are. Um, and I think it's important you're, that you are honest to yourself what type you are. Because if you feel, <clears throat> if you really want to be an entrepreneur, you know, then try and figure out entrepreneurial opportunities. That doesn't have to be your own business at the beginning. You can also join a younger company, uh, you know, with your qualification, which you get here. I'm, I'm sure the doors will be open. But then you, you join an entrepreneurial environment to learn about entrepreneurship, not only in theory, but also in practice. If you feel that's kind of cool to talk about, but not really you, that's also perfectly fine. Larger corporations also need great yeah. talent, and you can make a career there. Um, and I would say it's easier to go from a more entrepreneurial environment and grow there and become a, a, a bigger company from a niche to a bigger company and then potentially make a move to a corporation then getting spoiled for 10 years yeah. in a large corporation which is so much you know Tayloristic and where you have different and, and smaller usually smaller uh, a smaller scope and then become an entrepreneur 10 years later I personally you know think it's more difficult so it really is important that you're open and honest to yourself what you really are as a type if you need a bit more safety that's perfectly fine yeah, yeah? Join a larger company and, and, and make your way there. If you don't care so much about safety, if you are ready to fail, um, <clears throat> doesn't mean failing is nice, by the way. I wouldn't recommend to fail. Yeah. But if you're, willing, if you're willing to accept that it can fail, if you're willing to accept the consequences, then try out. Start with a smaller company, be, and then you found something later also. Mm -hmm. uh, then a very sophisticated question. Um, if I find it again, um, <clears throat> it was, what did you change or what would you recommend to change when changing from a managerial position, which was all about growth, like your no yeah. mobile thing, yeah. into a more... <clears throat> um, restructuring? Yes, restructuring. Um, yeah. <laughs> It's a totally different way to, to run a business. Uh, and <clears throat> quite frankly, in my case, I don't think I realized the size of the change, mm. the dimension of the change. Um, it was so different. Because in a company which grows from a few thousand employees to 
<clears throat> 30 some thousand employees, uh, sorry, to 50 some mm -hmm. thousand employees and to 30 billion revenues from a small business. That was T-Mobile at the time. Going into an area where, you know, we had to restructure 50,000 jobs. Um, we had to create, you know, outsource many, many thousand people into service companies, separate legal entities. We had to break the existing uh, established um, benefits and payment and w increase working hours and so on. And again, we had to manage old scandals which popped up. Um, it, was, it was a totally different way to do things. Um, I think it's important you realize what, you are, what, 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 what kind of change is ahead of you and you really think it through and you discuss and exchange with people who went through restructuring processes what kind of resistance you will get how you communicate. Uh, it's all about, today I would say it's all about open and transparent communication and be willing to weather the storm and to live with resistance. If you're not the type of guy who, who accepts to be alone for some time, because all of a sudden you are alone, alone out there, because nobody wants, you know, they all say, well, go, go, go for it. And, and you communicate about job cuts location closures when you need to, you know, we close yeah. down, you know, more than 100 locations in order to reduce it to, uh, you know, more modern service centers and so on. All of a sudden people, you know, make a distance and you're alone in that situation. So you need to understand who you are again mm. and whether you can do that. And if you can't, don't do it. If you're not the, the, if you don't feel you have it in you to go through such a difficult period to make people go through change processes and take those tough decisions and stand for them in public where you get tomatoes thrown at you. That sounds easy. It's not easy in that situation. Yeah. So it's, it's, very, it's very good to manage a growth company. It's a different, totally different ballgame to manage a restructuring process. W would you go as far as some observers um, say that a good growth CEO can't be a good restructuring CEO, so it takes no, the two no, of wouldn't. them? No, no, I wouldn't. And, uh, you know, with, with, with modesty and humbleness, I think we got well in the team, we did well in the T-Mobile growth phase, and we also did the restructuring. Initially, it was a bit brutal and a bit confrontational. I could have done better in yeah. that time. I think I should have been more open and engaging with the social partners at the beginning and kind yeah. of take them more alongside. So I've learned a couple of lessons. But bottom line, we went through the, we had to do what we had to do. We did it. The company turned out to be much stronger than before. And so, no, I think you can do, you can do both, mm -hmm. but you have to be aware of what you do and you have to have a plan. You need to you know, think it through. You have to get mentors on your side and so on. It takes mm -hmm. a lot. Uh, we still have a, a whole row of questions and uh, six minutes to go, so I just pick two. Uh, interesting one. What is the biggest misconception that people have about CEOs? Um, uh, I think people often mix the CEO function with the person. I think most CEOs who I've met and learn to know better over the years are actually good and ethical people. And I think the, the misperception in public <clears throat> is that they have to be like cold hard robots and you know, accept that there are casualties along the way, that it's all about being profitable and so on. The ones I know, they have a soul and they worry a lot about their decisions and the consequence of their decisions and they have good ethics. I'm not suggesting everybody has, but I think the, the vast majority do. So that generally they're better than they seem. Yeah, and, or, and, yeah. and in today's to world, yeah. you get re-elected every day by your people. And if you are not a good leader, an authentic person who has a good heart, I don't think people elect you, at least in, you know, they have choices. Talented people can go somewhere else tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So if you're a bad leader, they go, they're gone. Um, talking about leadership, that's uh, perhaps one of the last ones, uh, a personal one. What is the one thing you would do differently now looking back at your career? 
Oh, there's one thing I definitely would do different, um, and I would find a way somehow to scratch the money together uh, to do the studies uh, and to finalize and take a few more years for university and, pro and business school. Um, that is something I regret until today, that I haven't done that. And why? It, I mean, you made it up to the ranks, you're a happy man, uh, you make loads of money. But it's so much harder to learn the things later and to do it autodidactically and learn it all by yourself and it also is, you know, it, you, everything has its face, right? I mean, okay, so you do it a few years later, but you have your youth. I, I kind of was working like crazy when I was in my, in my early 20s already, uh, day and night. And, um, and again, I, I could have traveled the world yeah. and could have, you know, learned more and so yeah. on. I just, um, that I would do differently today, definitely. Okay. I would take the time to learn. I mean, that's good publicity for, for our school, but, but um, some entrepreneurs say, oh, this could tame the animal spirits. If uh, you, you get just spoiled. If you are too long at the university, you will lose your fighting spirit and, and they, they will make you kind of a standard model. Look, I, I know a number of fantastic founders and entrepreneurs and as far as I know, they've all been through a great education program. They worked very hard and diligently at university and did their masters or not. But, but at least they went through an, uh, an, uh, an academic education and learned, and learned a lot. And so, yes, there are the other examples as well. But the ones I know, they all did. And uh, mm. they still had, or they even more so had, not only the expertise mm. and the knowledge, mm. but they also had their fighting spirit. Mm. So, very last one, um, and, and I see you, you wear uh, proudly your pin of the Légion d'honneur, Officier de Légion yes, d'honneur. Yes, I do. So, w w what is your emotional link to France, is one question. Well, um, I've been, I felt a close uh, relation to France uh, since school. And my teacher, my, my French teacher, you know, took us and a small, small group of, of, of interested uh, students or, or pupils um, to his academic friends in uh, Dijon, sorry, in, uh, in Nancy and in other places in France. And, and so I, that's how I became familiar with French culture and rhetoric and discussions and literature. Um, and I always loved it. I loved, you know, we were poor at the time. We had no money, but yet it was a different lifestyle. And uh, I loved everything from the architecture to the, to the people, the intellectual exchange, to everything else. And that never went away. And, and then I was at BMW and they sent me to France for a few months to work there when I was 22. And then, you know, I, I always kept relations to French people. My, my daughter is married to uh, a wonderful uh, young man from France, from Paris, um, and I'm with Airbus. so. France and Germany, that combination, and, and France means a lot to me. Okay, thank you. So um, we see we couldn't have had a better uh, person, leader, to kick off uh, this new format, the French-German dialogue. Thank you very much for dedicating so much time sure. coming here. Uh, highly appreciated. And uh, thank you for joining us uh, today, virtually, due to Corona. Perhaps next time uh, we will be permitted to have even some guests here in the studio. Thank you very much for joining and we will keep you informed. Um, as said, there will be uh, a second uh, French-German uh, discourse, uh, probably someone in March or April this year. Thank you very much.